Hello. I'd like to start this uh, presentation by welcoming everyone who is joining us today for the SNEA Network Storage Forum sponsored presentation. In today's presentation, we'll be covering an introductory to NCAST, headline blocking, and congestion management. With me today are three industry experts that will be presenting for you while I'll be your moderator. Before I introduce everybody, I'd like to take a quick minute just to cover the Bright Talk user interface. First, some of the slides uh, may be small as well as the text. So I'd recommend enlarging your viewing area to full screen. This can be accomplished by clicking on the double arrows on the lower right-hand corner of your presentation. You'll also find a chat box where you can ask questions to your presenters. We encourage you to, take the, uh, to make this presentation interactive by asking questions. Um, however, I will wait until the end of each, presentation, each presenter's section before answering questions. Oftentimes, we have such great participation that we can't cover all the questions in the allotted presentation time. If that does happen today, we will be releasing a blog following the, the uh, presentation up to the SNEA website, which will contain all of the questions as well as uh, that were asked during the presentation, as well as their corresponding answers. Um, we oftentimes get requests for the presentations, um, which we will also be making avail available from the SNEA website after the webinar in a PDF format. Finally, we do request that you rate this presentation when you are finished watching it. You have an option of rating between one and five stars, with five being the best, and there is also a comment and suggestion area. We'd love to hear from you. We value your comments, and uh, they do help us to improve uh, the presentations for future viewings. So please help us out and provide a, uh, a, a quick uh, um, review, as well as any comments that may help us improve. So to, onward to, uh, to introducing the cast of characters that will be with me today in this, today's presentation. Working from left to right, I'm Tim Lustig, Corporate Director of Ethernet Marketing at Nellonox Technologies. I'm going to be your moderator for the, until the top of the hour. Um, I've got the easiest job here today. As a moderator, I'll just be introducing the topics and fielding your questions for our presenters. Next, we have Jane Metz, who sits on the SNEA Board of Directors and is the Data Center Technologist for Cisco, where he focuses on everything storage networking. Followed by Satish Ganestar Karen, hope I got that right, Satish, who's a distinguished engineer from Brocade Storage Networking Division of Broadcom. He's responsible for architect and design of fiber channel switches and defining the next generation products. And last, but surely not least, John Kim, one of my colleagues, who sits on this NIA NSF chair and uh, works at Milan storage marketing. Uh, real quick, I'd like to cover a few things about SNEA, who is uh, <clears throat> putting on this presentation today. We are a global industry association uh, chartered with advanced, advancing the adoption of storage networking. Within our charter, it is also to remain vendor neutral. So even though we have representation here from multiple, multiple different companies, uh, we strive to keep everything at a very neutral standpoint. We have over 185 industry-leading organizations with over 2,000 active contributing members at this time. As a global organization, we reach over 50,000 end users worldwide and focus on standards, adoption, and education. If you'd like to connect with us, you can learn more by reaching out to snea.org slash technical or um, following us on Twitter at snea.com. A couple of things we need to cover before we jump into the presentation. Of course, this is what our lawyers makes us include. This shouldn't surprise anyone. It's just standard legal talk. Uh, the material that you're seeing today is copyrighted by SNEA, and any use of material within the presentation is permitted as long as the slide is reproduced in its entirety, and SNEA is referenced as a source. Uh, also, be aware that there are no warranties expressed or implied on the information that's presented, and if you are using this information, be using it at your own risk. Real quick, before we uh, jump into the presentation, I want to go over a quick agenda. As you can see, it's pretty simple. Uh, first thing is why this presentation. Uh, before I answer that, I just want to go into real quick, each of the presenters will just cover a specific topic and how that protocol handles congestion management. Then we'll wrap up with questions and answers at the end of each of the sections. Uh, and pretty easy to uh, get into that. We'll just uh, kick off the presentation by saying, yes, all networks are su susceptible to congestion. 
Uh, this is also uh, becoming more and more pertinent as time moves forward because advances in storage technology are placing unusual burdens on the network today. With the uh, advent of flash and different types of faster media, which are cutting down on lat latencies. As well, the higher speeds um, we get, their increase of likelihood of congestion definitely will occur. So for these reasons, planning has become even more pertinent than ever. So we're hoping that uh, through this presentation, you will learn a little bit more about the planning process and take some things into consideration. Um, <clears throat> with that said, we hope that after viewing the webinar, you'll be more knowledgeable about making wrong assumptions as it can result in systems that are inefficient, insecure, and costly to maintain. Uh, when you hear of a large computer outage, it's oftentimes a result of some obscure computer crashing the entire system. It is often a result of poor assumptions that were made. So hopefully at the end of this presentation, you will find out what some of these assumptions are and be able to avoid those. We've listed a few of them here. These are taken from James Gosling's in 1997, The Falsities of Distributed computers, Computing. Uh, now things have changed since 1997 when this was written, and technology has continued to evolve. And while they are they are still relevant. Uh, they're not, maybe not as relevant as they were in the past, unless you're Google with Bezos-based replication, plenty of dark fiber and active transactional data replication. These factors should be considered uh, for you to overcome hurdles that may be in, your, in the possible future. So with that said, I'd like to uh, hand it off to our first presenter, Jay Metz, who will be covering Ethernet. Jay? Oh, <clears throat> thanks, Tim. Um, so uh, I think one of the most important things to remember about the subjects in this webinar is that the same themes will start coming up over and over again. In every one of these networks, you're going to find the potential for problems that arise from congestion in, in its various forms. Sometimes having a little bit of congestion isn't a big problem. In, in fact, sometimes a little bit of congestion is exactly what you need to regulate a system, as we'll see in a moment. Um, some applications in traffic can handle these issues with ease, but others, like storage, can have negative effects that wind up being ongoing and persistent. And of the three topics we're going to talk about today, um, perhaps Ethernet is the most involved in the sense that there's more going on inside of Ethernet traffic than just storage, which means that you can't only plan for your storage. You have to plan for the entire system as a whole and make sure that the storage is taken care of. So one of the things that's important to note is that, especially when it comes to storage networks, you should not be designing a network that has a lot of buffering. Now, what does this mean? Buffering is a situation where you are temporarily collecting and holding onto data. This is very useful for absorbing some of the natural traffic bursts and can help smooth out the data flow when you use it correctly. By the way, if you haven't seen our Everything You Wanted to Know About Storage But We're Too Proud to Ask series part teal, you may want to take a look at that for more in-depth discussion of buffers, queues, and caches. And the link to that will be provided at the end of, the, of, of this particular presentation. Back to the matter at hand, though. Uh, buffering in a storage network is an undesirable condition. And we really should be treating this with great care. So when you talk about networking characteristics of storage environments, whether they be within the context of fiber channel or Ethernet or InfiniBand, it's not a matter of the protocol, but rather it's a matter of the application I.O. requirements. In other words, the application is king, and we must all hail the king. Uh, mismatching an application with an incorrect networking configuration is a recipe for a very, very bad day. Now, as I said, not all data is equal. A packet isn't just a packet. It has meaning. And different types of traffic have different meanings, of course. So generally speaking, we can break these different types of traffics into flows. Now, some of these traffic types can be very small, but extremely latency sensitive. And these are often referred to as mice flows. Heartbeats between devices, for instance, are very small but very important to get to the destination on time. If they don't, then an entire sequence of events can happen that can get out of control very quickly. Other types of data may be more forgiving, um, but may wind up eating more and more of your allocated throughput. Things like distributed storage and the metadata for hyperconverged systems, for example, uh, might fall into this category. At the other end of the spectrum, 
you've got large flows, such as backup, replication, large file copies, and the like. And these are often referred to as elephant flows. Now, research has shown that of all the traffic in Ethernet, these types of flows can be about 5% of the total types of traffic, but take up 80 to 90% of the bandwidth. And this is where things can get tricky. So when these flows come into a switch, they start to fill up the buffer inside of a switch. Now, these buffers are made for handling this, and there's a lot of headroom built into the buffers for doing it. However, sometimes you can get a condition where those buffers fill up and can even overflow, and it can't take any more of those flows. So this can lead to something that, well, up until recently has been somewhat rare, but it's called in-caps, in-cast collapse. Excuse me. Now, in-cast happens when synchronized sessions arrive at a common congestion point at the same time. And each TCP session will grow the window until it detects congestion, which then triggers packet loss. At the same time, all of the TCP sessions will back off. And that is uh, what we call the in-cast collapse. Now, what's interesting is that as the throughput capabilities of the networks have increased and the workload scale to take advantage of this bandwidth, this problem becomes more and more common despite the increases in sizes of the buffers. So as an example, let's talk a little bit about NVMe over TCP for just a quick second. <coughs> Excuse me. In NVMe over TCP, each Q pair takes up a TCP session. In this example, then, you can imagine these red arrows as potential NVMe over TCP sessions, each with their own Q pair and each going to the same destination. So in this example, it's conceivable that a NVMe device could be receiving messages from a source which could wind up creating a buffer overflow situation, at which point all of the sessions will back off at the same time. Now, traditionally, buffers are handled in a first-in, first-out method, which means that as high-speed storage starts to hit the buffer, you could wind up with problems as these multiple large flows start to stack up. And that funky curve that you see in the lower right corner of the screen, well, that makes storage unhappy. And if you've ever seen the jagged sawtooth pattern, which is often associated with TCP traffic, then you know that it makes storage traffic really unhappy. Storage does not like inconsistency. So as you can see, having extremely low latency storage and high bandwidth networks isn't quite a panacea for all the problems in the data center. And one possible solution is to add more buffers to the problem so that you can avoid the overflow problem altogether at the penalty of adding latency. So the question therefore becomes, what can we do about it? And there are a few more methods of doing this. Um, for our purposes here, though, we're going to be looking at just two. I've already mentioned increasing the buffer size, but there's a couple of other ones that we can take a look at as well. And uh, the idea there is to be more proactive and to tell the sender to slow down before those packets get dropped. Now, obviously, I've already talked a little bit about this. The most obvious solution to be is increase the buffer size. Buffers, buffers everywhere. Everywhere you have buffers. Big buffers, huge buffers, gigantic buffers. But obviously, having more buffer uh, allows applications to continue to send data for a longer period of time. It just doesn't come without a cost, however. So the first thing to keep in mind is that there must be a direct relationship between the amount of data and the size of the buffer. That means that as the bandwidth requirements grow, so must the size of the buffers. Now, over time, this can get unwieldy. Well, there are other consequences as well. I mean, flow control is handled by TCP. And for most TCP stacks to control the flows, drops wind up being a necessary component. Those drops are feedback signals that are sent when the buffer occupancy is high. By adding in additional, additional buffers, you tend to artificially change the environment for accurate reporting of the TCP congestion control. Another issue is that the bigger buffers have an undesirable effect of adding additional latency. First in, first out buffer management means that these small mice flows can still get stuck behind the large elephant flows, but now there are more of them. So now we have to take a look at a more proactive approach. Rather than waiting for the TCP packets to get dropped and the window sizes to reorient themselves. Once again, it's important to note that what I'm talking about here is one possible solution. There are, there are others. 
but it's useful to also remember that we don't have to use a blunt instrument, like just throwing buffers at the problem, in order to solve it. Well, first, there's something called explicit congestion notification, or ECN. ECN is a proactive method for notifying endpoints that use the IP header. When we talk about IP-based storage, we can use ECN. Second, we have something called data center TCP, or DC TCP, which is the algorithm used to modify the sending rate of the data. So let's take a quick look at both of these. ECN is used to first notify every device in the transit path that is capable, including the sender and the receiver. So when we get congestion somewhere in the path, we're going to set the bits in the IP header to notify that there's congestion. We still let the packets through. We don't drop them. We just inject the proper bits in the deserved field values. This is then taken by the receiver, which is then going to echo it back to the sender and tell the sender to slow down. We do that as long as someone in the path is setting the ECN bits to two ones. We echo it back and say, hey, there's congestion, slow down. And we do this because we want to notify congestion before we start to drop packets and need to wait for any kind of timeouts. Now, if the ECN is the marking, then data center TCP or DC TCP is the algorithm to handle the reduction in sending traffic. Now, this helps to achieve high burst tolerance and low latency and high throughput, all with shallow buffers. So ECN is the early warning detection system. DCTCP is a traffic cop to control the traffic. So instead of the blunt force instrument where the presence of congestion causes a severe back off event, we can now react in proportion to the extent of the congestion. In turn, this has an added benefit of reducing the variability in the sending rate, which means we can handle bursts in a more finely granular manner. Now the great thing about DCTCP is that it allows you to use those shallow buffered switches. In fact, DC TCP can deliver the same or better throughput than TCP while using 90% less buffer space with high burst tolerance and, a lot, uh, and low latency for those short flows. I even have a, uh, a paper from MIT at the end in the resource section that can go into the details about that. So what happens? What are the consequences? What, what, what if we use DC TCP with ECN? Supposing we have a sender that's connected to a host with multiple Q pairs each with their own TCP session. For example, NVMe over TCP. In that case, notification is gonna get sent back to the sender on a per queue basis, also a per TCP session basis. The sender can then understand what's happening and can pull back on the traffic before we get to a problem state. Now, whereas the, before the packets would have been unceremoniously dropped and the sender receives a notice via timeout, which is expensive in storage terms, now the consistency of the traffic is far closer to what the application expects when using TCP. That smooth curve that you see, that, that nice smooth curve, well, that's precisely the kind of behavior that storage traffic likes. It makes it happy. And after all, if the storage ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Now, in order uh, to make us all very happy about Fiber Channel, I'm going to take a quick pause and see if there's any questions before passing things off to Satish. Any questions, Tim? You know, Jay, it looks like there's a couple comments. I don't know if they're really questions. Um, one of them just asked to mention something in the FAQ, and the other one is in regards to uh, one of the slides. So I think we're ready to go on. If there's a, any other questions, please put them in now. Not? All right. We'll turn it over to Satish. Satish, take it away. All right. Good morning, everyone. My name is Satish. Don't try pronouncing my last name as Tim found out. It'll take you 10 seconds to untwist your tongue. Um, if you're Indian, it only takes you five seconds. But um, anyway, we're going to be talking about uh, congestion in fiber channel networks. Uh, we'll start out with defining what congestion is. We'll talk about how a lossless versus a non-lossless network um, differ in terms of how they deal with congestion. Uh, we'll focus on the lossless aspects of fiber channel. How, how is it actually enforced and implemented within fiber channel networks? Uh, we'll also talk about different causes of congestion in the fiber channel networks, and finally, we'll close it with different solutions that a fiber channel, solution, a fiber channel network supports to address these uh, congestion scenarios. All right. All right, so what is uh, congestion? So congestion is a 
effectively, um, the transmitting port is attempting to send more traffic than the receiving port can handle. And uh, there can be various reasons. We'll talk about those reasons later on. Um, but one fundamental um, characteristic of all these different scenarios is that the receiving port just does not have enough memory to receive more frames. Uh, it's basically um, used up all its memory. It can't receive any more frames. And at that point in time, uh, any further traffic that's coming in uh, does not have a place to go. Uh, in a non-lossless network, for lack of a better word, uh, what happens in this situation is uh, the receiver simply drops a packet. Um, the transmitter sends without regard to whether the receiver is able to receive or not. And when it receives a frame and it doesn't have a memory for it, it simply just drops it. Uh, the expectation here is that the endpoints, the source of the traffic and the destination of the uh, traffic, they coordinate, uh, they detect the uh, packet drop and they retry and, uh, till they successfully complete. Um, and one issue here is that the retry does not necessarily guarantee that it's going to succeed, right? Because you may run into the same issue again. Uh, and it can have significant performance impact. And some of these uh, issues uh, actually uh, Mets talked about. As opposed to this, in a lossless network, what happens is the receiving port paces the transmitter. The transmitter is not able to send a frame unless the receiver lets it do so. Um, so the good, the big advantage of this kind of um, solution is that um, it handles bursty traffic, uh, temporary condition very nicely because the frames are held in the transmitter's buffer. Uh, they are not dropped, uh, which means that once the receiver is able to receive the frames, the frames can be quickly sent out without involving uh, the endpoints. Um, of course, um, um, if the condition is sustained, that means that um, uh, the transmitter is unable to send packets for a long enough time, uh, then you have a situation where it can lead to performance impact and worst case scenarios, it can lead to application failures. All right, so um, we now talk a little bit about uh, the credit accounting and how the lossless aspect of fiber channel comes about. So essentially, it's a credit-based uh, lossless network. Uh, when a link comes up, uh, each side, each port, tells the other side how much frame memory it's got to receive packets from the other port. And um, essentially, the transmitter uh, uses these buffer credits, uh, the number of credits that the receiver tells it, uh, to determine how many frames it can send and whether it can send a frame at all in the first place. So as the link comes up, the receiver tells the transmitter it's got X number of credits, and it is that many uh, frames. The X frames is what the transmitter can send till it waits for a credit uh, to come back from the receiver. And the receiver, when it receives a frame, it's going to process that frame. And once that frame processing is complete, it frees that buffer, it frees that memory, and which is now ready to receive another frame. And now it indicates the transmitter that one, uh, it has another memory block free by sending a credit back, uh, back to the receiver, uh, sorry, to the transmitter. So as you can see in the picture, you got um, a link with uh, fiber channel ports on either side. Uh, transmitting from the left to right and receiving on the left, uh, right side. Um, so uh, the receiver receives the packets, pro processes them, and when it finishes uh, processing these packets, it's going to send a, a credit back through the already mechanism, which is basically a signal uh, that is not a subject to flow control. So you're always guaranteed to send these signals uh, irrespective of whatever is happening in the frame memory on the, uh, the transmitting side. All right, so now um, so we now just talked about how a lossless credit-based mechanism works, and fiber channel is exactly that. It, it is a credit-based lossless network. Um, we talked about how it deals with uh, congestion nicely because it doesn't drop packets. It's able to paste the transmitter, but it's not immune to congestion. Uh, indeed, uh, when congestion is sustained, um, because of the lossless nature of the network, what happens is when one port is congested and it applies back pressure but not, not releasing credits to the transmitter, that port now indeed becomes a congestion point and actually can uh, affect downstream ports by pausing them or not uh, releasing credits back to them. As a result, you can have a situation where one congestion point can actually spread through the network and affect multiple uh, ports within the fabric and indeed can affect completely unrelated flows. Um, we'll talk about a little bit more detail on this as we go forward. Um, in a fiber channel network, basically, there are three causes of condition, right? Um, one is a loss credit. It's a credit-based mechanism. 
if when uh, credits are being transmitted um, across the link, um, if a credit is lost because there is an error um, in the link, because there is quality issues in the link, then you can have a situation where credits are lost, and as a result, you could have performance issues. We'll go through some details there. Uh, a credit stall uh, happens when the receiving port simply does not return credits for whatever reason. It could be because the receiving port is misbehaving, or it could be there are some resource issues on the receiving side, but it simply doesn't return credits. And the third situation is where when the offered load, what is being attempted to send over a link, is more than the capacity of the link. So obviously, there's going to be traffic that cannot go through, and there's going to be a backup, and that can result in congestion as well. So we'll go through those three causes in more detail one at a time. So the first situation is a lost credit. So as I talked about this, the transmitter keeps track of how many credits it has, um, which indicate the resources that are available on the receive side, so it can transmit these frames. Now, way the, the way the credit accounting works is that when the transmitter transmits a frame, it reduces the number of credits it has available because it's used up one credit. And when the receiver receives it and processes that frame and freezes that memory, it sends back a credit. And when the transmitter receives that credit back, now it bumps up the credit uh, account to say it's got one more credit. Um, now, when the transmitter sends a frame, what could happen on the wire is if you have a bad cable, bad SFP, you could have the start of frame, which indicates that it's actually a frame. That could actually be corrupted, which means that the receiver does not know that it's receiving a frame. You can't even detect that it's a frame, while the transmitter thinks it's actually sent a frame. Now, the receiver obviously doesn't even see the frame. It doesn't return a credit. Uh, the transmitter is expecting a credit, which never comes back. This is one situation how we can lose a credit. Another situation is the receiver receives a frame, it processes it, and it says, okay, my memory is free. Let me send the credit back. It sends it on the wire, and the credit gets corrupted. Now, the transmitter never receives that credit. So in both these situations, the transmitter has one less credit. Um, as a result, what happens is now we have a situation where the transmitter sees less credits, and the receiver is seeing less frames because the transmitter is now artificially throttled uh, because of lower number of credits. Um, once the transmission rate slows down, uh, the only way to recover from the situation is to kind of reset the link and go back to the zero state uh, where both endpoints go back to reloading the uh, total number of credits and starting traffic all over again. And you can see in this picture, um, basically what I just talked about, you have a switch that's attempting to send traffic frames to a server. And the server, while receiving a frame, and the frame can get corrupted, and the server does not even detect the frame, and so it doesn't send credits back, or it's processed the frame. While sending the credit back, the credit gets corrupted. In both situations, the switch is one less credit now, has one less credit. The second situation is that causes congestion in a fiber channel network is a device credit stall. So in this case, um, the, the accounting, credit accounting is perfectly fine on the, on, the, on the receive side, on the transmit side. But what happens is while the receiver receives packets, for whatever reason, uh, it could be a bug on the receiving side, it could be a resource contention on the receiving side, the frames are not processed, which means that the memory cannot be freed. As a result, uh, credits are not returned back to the uh, transmitter. So now the transmitter has all these frames distinct for this device, that are held in its queue, and it prevents frame flow. And when, once the queue builds up, you also have this problem where, because of the lossless nature, it's going to spread to other upstream ports uh, that are sending traffic to this port. Um, ultimately, uh, this is a situation where it won't not only affects this particular port that's misbehaving or this particular device that's misbehaving, it's going to potentially affect multiple other flows uh, that are completely unrelated and going through the network. And like in this picture, you can see there's a switch that's attempting to send packets to this server. The server receives those packets, but the server is simply not returning credits back. And in this case, in this situation, the switch has all these packets that are destined uh, to this particular server that's going to be held up in the switch queues. And the last situation for a condition in a fiber channel network is port over subscription. Basically, uh, oversubscription is a situation where um, the amount of traffic that's being generated from the source is much more than the capacity of the link. 
uh, essentially you have traffic that's coming into the fabric and you're attempting to send it over a link, but the amount of the, the, the rate at which traffic is coming in and needs to be sent over the link is greater than the link speed. Uh, and again, in this situation, there is no credit issue. Frames are flowing at full speed, whatever the link speed is capable of. Credits are coming back at the right speed. Everything looks fine on the link itself, but the fact that there are more frames coming into the uh, transmitter port uh, means that those frames need to be held in the transmitter port because it just doesn't have some, uh, enough bandwidth to send it over the link. Uh, and again, uh, in this case, uh, one important thing to understand is that when there is congestion, um, the drain rate as you go upstream actually reduces considerably. The drain rate on this oversubscribed port is actually full speed. It's running at link speed. But if you go one hop away and you have eight ports fanning into this uh, oversubscribed port, the drain rate on one of those eight ports is actually one eight because the drain rate on the oversubscribed port is now actually distributed across the eight ports. Uh, so this is the fundamental nature of uh, the fan in and that causes much more severe secondary congestion point rather than, um, than compared to the, uh, the source of the congestion itself. And so uh, just like in the other cases, you have situations where it's not only the flow that's the culprit uh, that's affected, but it's also completely unrelated victim flows that go through these secondary condition points that could potentially be affected much more uh, than the culprit itself. And now um, I'll talk a little bit about the impact of condition. Um, it's obvious to some extent, uh, but essentially when you have condition, um, you have um, ports that are uh, back pressuring traffic, um, flow performance that is going to go down, the, the rate at which packets that are sent for these flows is going to go down. So in the end, you achieve suboptimal uh, performance. You're going to have higher IO completion times, higher network latencies, your IOPS is going to come down. So ultimately, there is application impact. Now, um, sustained condition, as I talked about, this is one of the key aspects that it just radiates to the upstream port. Um, from the receiver, uh, which, which has a condition um, uh, in the receiver port or the transmit port, it radiates down to the, all the upstream ports and affects completely unrelated flows. Um, and, and that very fact that it can actually affect the fabric, not just the port that is congested, uh, has impact a significant number of flows. Um, when the congestion impact is uh, mild to moderate, uh, what you typically have is just slowness. Uh, just IOs take longer to complete, your throughput comes down, your IOPS go down a bit. But when the congestion gets to a point where it's very severe, uh, you can end up in a situation where frames are held so long uh, in the ports, in the fabric, um, we're talking about tens of hundreds of milliseconds. And in that case, the fabric, the only way for the fabric to recover is actually drop frames. Um, in those situations, when frames are dropped, uh, it does require a retry. It does require the uh, endpoints to retry, just like in the um, non-lossless situation. And uh, that potentially can lead to application failures as well. All right, so now um, we'll close it with the solutions that we have uh, in Fiber Channel to address the uh, congestion. So um, the first point is detection. Um, one of the key things is that the cause of congestion is very much relevant to what mitigation actions you're gonna take. So identify this, identifying the specific cause of congestion, one of the three cases we talked about is very much relevant. Um, and of course, if it's related to a cable issue, SFP quality issue, then simply notifying the SAN administrator and letting him um, change, replace the cable of the SFP um, uh, basically fixes the problem. Uh, when you have a credit loss, one of the things that we can do and our systems do that in Fiber Channel is to be able to recover those lost credits by resetting the link. Um, when a transmitter determines that there is just inordinate delay in credits coming back, the transmitter can initiate a link reset protocol that asks the receiver to reset its credits and go through the uh, link, uh, link initialization protocol again. And this would basically recover and start uh, the, the traffic flowing again. Uh, and a second recovery mechanism is, um, is an inbuilt uh, credit recovery mechanism that dynamically and in real time detects if there is potential uh, credit loss by coordinating and synchronizing with the receiver. If such a condition is detected, then the receiver and the transmitter, they basically replenish and restore the credit that's been lost. Um, and another way of mitigating and in some cases solving the condition issue is isolation. 
essentially the approach here is to isolate the flows that cause condition into separate dedicated sets of resources that do not overlap with the resources that are used by majority of the SAN. Um, so port fencing is a simplistic solution where when there is a congested port, you go disable that port, that basically protects the rest of the fabric. And if there is uh, alternate paths available to the congested port, that can be picked up by the multipath software. Uh, virtual channels is another mechanism where on the same physical link, you have separate TX, RX, credit accounting, and buffer mechanisms that are completely isolated from each other. So flows that use one virtual channel do not impact and do not get impacted by other flows in another virtual channel. So this allows to isolate congested flows. Another solution is for SAN administrators to uh, create virtual fabrics with their dedicated links, physical isolation using um, and uh, isolate these congested flows. So um, these are all the solutions that we have uh, to make a uh, fiber channel uh, much more resilient to deal with uh, condition issues. All right, that's all I got. Any questions? Thanks, Satish. Yeah, there's a few questions there. We'll start just from the top here. Is oversubscription a case of the server and or switch endpoint being faster than the link? Yes, so um, oversubscription is a case where um, the traffic that's Typically, a server asks for data from the storage, and when it asks for data from multiple storage, all these different storage ports are sending traffic simultaneously at the same time. And so the effective rate at which the traffic is coming back into the server can be much more can, than what the server port can handle. Uh, it's not simply the switch sending more. The switch can only send it at the speed that the link is capable of. It's really the server asking for more data simultaneously from multiple storage points, and this aggregate throughput that's coming back is greater than the capacity of the link to the server. Okay, let's move um, on to the next question. Admission control, um, fiber channel buffer credit scheme has the drawback of usually underutilized, underutilization of the links, especially if your workload uses many small frames rather than full-size frames. Yes, so uh, that's a good question. Uh, so the way the credit mechanism work, works is that you initialize based on the number of buffers that the Rx port has. So it's really a function of how much memory, how much resources you have on the Rx side. So you could handle small frames nicely by allocating more buffers to start with and advertising a higher number of credits to the TX side. So even though uh, you have small frames, you still have enough credits to continuously saturate the link. All right, we go to the next one. Yeah, so a follow along is that uh, can't the switch regulate the incoming flows? Yes, uh, the switch can regulate the incoming flows. Um, the issue though is that uh, ultimately, the source has to throttle how much data is coming in. So as I pointed out, you could have multiple source points and it's simply not practical for the switches within the fabric to determine how much to throttle all these different source points. So the best way to handle this is to actually indicate to the source points and throttle them back so they know how much they're sending and to coordinate among themselves. Okay, great. Thank you. We got the questions keep coming in. We'll ask, we'll, we'll go to one more. Is the fiber channel protocol considering, considered a back off mechanism like DC TCP? Yeah, so it's, um, there are multiple ways to address this. So, so in fiber channel, uh, as I talked about, we use virtual channel mechanisms to isolate. That's actually um, a resilient mechanism because it does not depend on the endpoint behavior. Um, but also, yes, so we could use a DCTCP mechanism by similar to that, by providing notification to the endpoints when we detect condition sources and uh, let the endpoints deal with the condition by throttling back and reducing the throughput as needed. Great, uh, thanks Satish. A lot of questions there, we've got a few more. We're gonna go ahead and try to get those at the end of the presentation so that we make sure we have time to fit in John and, um, and Infiniband topics. So let's turn it over to John right now and we'll come back to questions at the, after John's, uh, end, of, end of John's presentation. All right, thank you.
Hello, everyone. This is John Kim from Mellanox, and I'm happy to cover InfiniBand. But in my presentation, I will also address uh, some of the other questions about congestion and congestion management, which apply actually to more networks than just InfiniBand. But first, talking about InfiniBand, it is a credit-based lossless network, so that's actually kind of similar to what Satish said about Fiber Channel. It's lossless because the transmitter cannot send unless the receiver has resources. And it's credit-based because the credits are used to track those resources. So Satish actually already did a great job of describing how that works in Fiber Channel. And it's very similar in InfiniBand that the receiver uh, issues credits saying how much data it can accept, and then the sender only sends as much data as the credits say uh, should be sent. InfiniBand is also designed to be very low latency. It supports RDMA, which is remote direct memory access, and it has various offloads, uh, which can offload different tasks on the network, uh, mostly for networking, but also for some things. Some of the in-network computing is possible, so some calculations are actually done uh, by the InfiniBand network as the data is moving. So InfiniBand, uh, as and actually very similar, sim again, similar to what uh, Jay and what Satish talked about, the main cause of congestion in InfiniBand is when you get oversubscription. And to review, that is when you're sending more data to a particular destination, or either through a particular switch link or through a particular receiver. It could be a server. It could be storage. You're trying to send more data than it can receive. Uh, this is often caused by incast, which is several, either several uh, endpoints sending data to storage or several storage devices trying to send data to one compute node at the same time. Uh, but it, that's a typical cause of incast. But it can also be caused by hardware failure. And I won't go into as much detail as Satish did, but uh, so very similar situations to what he described for Fiber Channel could also cause congestion in InfiniBand. But most of the time, that congestion is from uh, incast, or basically too much traffic trying to go to one place at the same time. Now, because it's a lossless network, if one destination is congested, the sender will wait. So in regular TCP, if you have too much traffic, eventually some packets get dropped, and that tells the senders, oh, packets got dropped, let's slow down or back off. But in InfiniBand, being lossless, uh, the senders know that the receiver can't send more, so they pause, they stop sending. And that could be a switch, or it could be the original, uh, original source or node, or compute node, or storage node, node that's sending the data. But normally the switch pauses. But, and this is fine, because it prevents you from losing data, and it regulates the traffic. But if you pause too long, then this can cause problems. Uh, you can cause, you know, the application could time out, uh, the network could time out because you're waiting too long. And if you pause too long at one point, at one switch in the network, the congestion could spread, especially in larger networks that have multiple switches. And then flows to other, uh, other destinations can be affected if they share a switch. And I'll show this in a diagram. So Jay talked about you might have an elephant flow and a mouse flow. And some of these large, uh, consistent flows of traffic could, in fact, interfere with the smaller bursty or smaller uh, you know, sporadic data flows. And it can cause problems on a network. So if this happens, then the flows which get victimized are called victim flows, or, and they often are what we call these small mice flows. Uh, and this is happened, something which can happen not just in InfiniBand, but also with Ethernet or with Fiber Channel. So let's talk about in a diagram and show how this can actually happen. So in this network, we have three switches and we have five nodes. So we start out, nodes A and B are trying to send traffic to node D. And so let's say they're all sending at full rate, so they're sending traffic faster than node D can receive it. So, so if we don't have any congestion management and we have a lossless network, so what happens is node D, when it reaches its limit, it says, hey, I'm accepting data as fast as I can, please slow down or take a pause, and so the switch, shown here as switch number two, says, okay, no problem, I'll wait. But as it waits, its buffers start to fill up with the data that keeps coming in from nodes A and B. And if it has to just wait for a short time for a traffic burst, as Jay said, then that's fine. The buffers can, use, can smooth out that traffic, they'll absorb the burst of traffic, and then when node D is ready, they'll go ahead and transmit the data to node D and everyone's happy. But if, uh, you, know, if you pause too long, then this can cause other problems, as I'll cover on the next slide. But initially starting, some traffic builds up. Node D has to asks everyone to pause. Switch 2 can buffer that traffic. And as long as the buffers don't fill up, everything's still OK. So you see that the purple flow, we'll call that the mouse flow, this purple traffic flow from node C to node E, it's still fine, because it's not going through switch number 2. 
So again, we have some temporary congestion just at one switch, and the buffers can handle it, so there's no spreading of congestion and no other traffic flows are affected. However, let's say that congestion really persists. The congestion lasts too long on switch two and the buffers fill up. Well, then switch two will tell the other incoming traffic, in this case switch one, hey, you have to stop sending me more data. So it tells, since node D told switch two to pause and then the buffers filled up, switch two then tells no, switch one, hey, you better stop sending me more traffic, and switch one starts hanging on to that traffic and buffering it. If, switch one's bu if the buffers on switch one fill up, now other flows that go through switch one become victimized or also affected by the congestion. So in this case, now that the congestion has spread from switch number two to switch number one, the data flow from node C, the one shown in purple, going to node E, that one is also affected by the congestion or what we call victimized. So the purple flow now becomes the victim flow. Um, and if it's a small sporadic flow and the gray flows are large ones, then we say the elephant flow has squashed the mouse flow, the mouse traffic flow, or victimized that flow. So now this is a case of congestion spreading, which can happen on, a, again, a lossless network, whether it's lossless InfiniBand or a lossless uh, TCP, or, or Rocky, which is usually used on a lossless network. Uh, for Ethernet. So we have the option to do congestion management or congestion control. And again, this is available in data center TCP, as Jay said. It's available in InfiniBand. It's available in Rocky. And in this case, uh, what happens is when, when the switch number two detects that its buffers are filling up and congestion might happen, it marks some packets. And those packets go on to node D, the destination, and node D says, hey, I see there's congestion happening on this switch. I'm going to tell all the people sending data to me to slow down. So in this case, uh, it, it signal, sends a signal back to nodes A and nodes B and says, hey, please slow down. We have some congestion. Nodes A and B then immediately slow down. And how much they slow down and for how long they slow down depends on the congestion control uh, settings that you use. But because they slow down, this avoids actual congestion from happening on switch number two, which then avoids having any congestion happening on switch number one. So in this case, the traffic speed is regulating, uh, sort of self-regulating, and this means that the purple data flow from node C to node E can continue. Uh, it may be slowed down a little bit, but it can continue without being stopped or paused by that oversubscription or that in-cast traffic from nodes A and B going to node D. So this is done in InfiniBand, again, based, again, on congestion control. It can be done in data center TCP with uh, ECN notifications. Uh, and it can also be done in Rocky with ECM notifications. Uh, and it can be done in regular TCP as well. Uh, as Jay mentioned, this is, you drop some packets, which allows you to drop some packets a little early, and those drop packets tell the senders, hey, you have to slow down, there's congestion. So this kind of congestion control mechanism is widely available across different kinds of networks. Okay, now back, so again, that was a general example. It applies to more than just InfiniBand. But going back to InfiniBand, so how do we handle congestion? How do we avoid it? The basic answer is a one you can over-provision. Over-provision means you just get faster switches and more links and faster links to the servers, to the storage. And this means you have less chance of congestion because you have less chance of filling up any particular link. Uh, now, however, that it works, but it's also kind of expensive. And you often end up with lower link utilization because you're buying extra link bandwidth or more links and not using them all. Most of the time, you're not using them all. So if you're willing to spend the money, that's a good way to avoid congestion. A second mechanism is, is congestion control. And as I showed, this works very similarly to Ethernet ECN. And not exactly the same, but it has some similarities to TCP as well. Notifications. There also is an adaptive routing mechanism available in InfiniBand and in some other uh, Ethernet, uh, some other, and I think in Fiber Channel as well, where if you have multiple routes between two points, then they can choose the least congested route. So if you have multipathing, instead of just picking the default route and always using that route until, unless it's failed, you can send traffic on, you can choose the route which has less traffic and less lower latency. So adaptive routing can be a smart way to, work, to solve congestion, but it only works if you have multiple paths between the endpoints, and it doesn't work if both links get completely full. And finally, there's virtual lanes. This is available in uh, Fiber Channel. It's available in InfiniBand. And this means that you have different flows or different virtual lanes, and you have different, you have the credit system uh, works per lane. So that means if you have lanes A, B, C, and D, and lane A gets fully busy, 
then the credits will cause it to pause or slow down in lane A, but the traffic will still flow at regular speed on lanes B, C, and D. So this means that congestion or incast on one particular type of traffic class or lane will only affect that lane and not affect the others. So this means as long as you put different kinds of traffic into different virtual lanes, then with fiber channel or InfiniBand, and I believe there's a mechanism similar to this in Ethernet as well, then you can have avoid congestion that way by uh, segregating the traffic into different virtual networks or virtual lanes within the network. All right, so that's the end of my section. And uh, Tim, let me turn it back over to you to cover the summary and then get to all those wonderful questions that we have coming in. Thanks, John. Uh, we do have some questions. Looks like a lot of them are going to be fiber channel based. Uh, before we get into that real quick, just uh, a quick summary. Uh, as we mentioned at the beginning, advances in storage are impacting networks. So we're going to see this across any type of uh, network, especially with the, more of the, uh, the high performance um, uh, type of storage being, that is being connected to it. Network congestion is going to be different by network type as well, and the way they handle it is is um, as well as we saw, can be similar in certain situations and can be different in others. So issues and symptoms that we need to look out for, in-cast collapse, elephant flows as well as mice flows, uh, lost credits, buffer credits, things of that nature, credit stalls and oversubscription that can become uh, pertinent issues, and of course hardware failures and then head line blocking and victim flows. Uh, some of the cures that we're seeing across these networks are data center TCP, which can resolve that through ECN, um, link reset, credit recovery through uh, virtual channels, port fencing, uh, over-provisioning, adaptive routing, and virtual lanes. All are ways that we can overcome some of these uh, oversubscription and congestion mechanisms. We go on to the uh, last few slides of what we have here. Uh, just a, a quick reminder that uh, we'd like you to rate the webcast before you uh, exit. If you give us some feedback, we can use that to help improve uh, future podcasts for you or webcasts as well. If you're looking for the slides, they will be up. It usually takes uh, about a day or so to get those up, and then as well a full Q&A from the webcast will be released in the blog. And if you follow us on Twitter, we will release um, a notification when that is up, and um, we'll have all the questions to your answers that were not covered. We still have a, a few minutes here, so we're going to try to get into those questions. Uh, I'm just going to turn it here to the resources. There were a few resources that were used in this um, presentation, so uh, we'll uh, – there we go – turn it to that, and so you guys can look at that real quick while we try to answer the rest of the questions. Uh, first question here, let me see if I can read through it, and then we'll see if we can assign it to somebody. How does over-provisioning and over-subscription differ in over-provisioning? Does the sender know the receiver rate? To begin with, and is oversubscription is it in is it otherwise? Huh. Uh, John, I think that might have been a question for Infiniband. Well, I think it's probably a general network question, but I'll try to answer it. So I would say overprovisioning is when you apply extra bandwidth or more links than you think you will need most of the time, and oversubscription is actually when you have uh, more where the nodes, the different nodes or storage devices can potentially use more bandwidth than you have. So oversubscription, over-provisioning is, a, again, you know, extra bandwidth, saying I'm not going to use it all, all the time. And oversubscription is, well, most of the links won't be using it all the time, so I'll actually set up uh, more traffic to go through the switch, or potentially more traffic than it can be handled by the links, uh, on the assumption that not all the nodes or not all the links will be, will be, will be transmitting at the same time. Perfect. Thanks, John. Uh, next, I, we have a couple of questions for Jay on here. Um, Jay, virtual oh, channels uh, would be equivalent to priority flow control. The trick is that in standard TCP IP, no one really uses different queues, TCP, QoS, to really differentiate between flows of the same application, but different sessions, only different applications. Okay. So, I, I see what they're saying. The question, perhaps. Yeah, I, I think I understand what they're saying. Um, let me try to Looking let me try to re regurgitate this a little bit. Yeah. Um, so when we start talking about the different uh, priorities, which are uh, somewhat of a misnomer for people in storage, because in the internet priorities don't count as what's important. They are basically lanes that are separated out according to 802.1p. 
And there's eight of them. There's eight different priorities, or you can think of them in, a, in their own way as lanes or channels or those kinds of things. They basically separate out the traffic on a link. We use different methods of flow control per priority or per lane. So priority flow control, for instance, or PSC, would be a flow control mechanism that is used on a priority, hence the name priority flow control. Um, that would be a flow control mechanism on a specific class of servers on an Ethernet link. You can apply different flow controls on different lanes, on different priorities. So when we use um, these kinds of, of systems, um, you can actually apply the flow control mechanisms on a per class of service basis. And so to that end, the, the question is, is correct. Um, in that we would we would I, I isolate first the different classes of service and then apply the flow control mechanism per that class and the application requirements. Thanks, I hope Jay. that made sense. I think it did. Uh, next question, we're going to go back out to Satish. So should, Satish, shouldn't the storage system have the same credit-based system to regulate the incoming flow as the switch? Yes, so um, there are two types of flow control that we talk about here. One is a link level, buffer to buffer. That means on a given link from the TX port to the RX port. But there is also flow control that we're talking about from a bigger perspe uh, picture perspective where you have an endpoint that is receiving traffic from multiple sources. Uh, while the buffer to buffer flow control addresses the link level uh, utilization and making sure it's not overrun, uh, but if you have an endpoint that is receiving traffic from multiple sources, uh, that needs to be coordinated at a different level. And uh, the proposal here is then that's what typically causes oversubscription. And, and you could address this in many ways. And one of those ways is basically to provide a notification um, from the fabric or from the endpoint to the sources to indicate that there is congestion, there is too much data being sent, and uh, throttling needs to happen. And to teach following along with that, is the credit issuance from the switch or from the transmitting device? Yeah, so the, so the credit issuance happens at the link level in two directions. So there are completely independent credit accounting mechanisms that are happening for the two different directions. So a, a port from a TX perspective is looking at the credits that it can use to transmit, and that credit is based on what the receipt port has told it. As what the receipt port is advertised. And similarly, the same port for receiving traffic, it has a set of buffers that it has allocated. And that is what it's adver advertised to the transmitting port. And so this credit accounting works on every fiber channel link independently in those two directions. Thanks, Satish. And we got another question for you here is, that goes along with the uh, long distance fiber channel networks. Do they need to have giant buffers to handle all the data required to keep the link full for the time that it takes to release credit? If not, how is a long distance supported in returning credits? Yes, uh, excellent question. So you're right. So for any given link, there are multiple factors that determine what is the right number of buffers or the minimum number of buffers that you need to have to make sure the link can be saturated. And uh, of course, one of those factors is the frame size. I think previously there was a question about how the frame size affects the number of buffers. Another factor is the length or the distance uh, from the, uh, the TX port to the RX port. And that indirectly is gonna determine how long it's gonna take for the credit to come back after the receive side has processed the frame. So in sizing the number of buffers, all of these, the speed, the frame size, average frame size, and the distance, all of these go into calculating what, right, what is the right number of buffers that the receipt port needs to have to maintain full speed on that link. Jay, we got a question for you here. So how many IP switch vendors today support DCTCP? Uh, that is an excellent question. I was kind of hoping that one could go to the Q and A. <laughs> um, I, I actually don't really know. I, I know that I know that there are there are a few, um, but in the interest of, of maintaining vendor neutrality, we we wouldn't really be able to answer that question anyway. I think the best way to do this is to to look at your favorite switch vendor and see if 
um, if they support DCTCP, and if so, in what manner. Uh, one quick correction, by the way. Uh, somebody on the, the Q&A uh, pointed out that I made an error earlier, and I want to do a quick correction. I will, I will fix this for the, uh, for the updated slides. We already have them posted, I know, but I'll, I'll fix them for later on. Um, I mentioned that the, the ECN uh, tags were in the, um, uh, in the DIFSER field, and they're not. I, I, made, I made that mistake. They're actually in the, uh, the TOS octet, and they're next to the DIFSER field. And that was my apologies. My bad. I will fix that, and I want to thank whoever, whoever corrected me in the Q&A for that opportunity to, to fix that mistake. So thank you. Great. I want to take a, just a minute to thank our presenters. Uh, everyone did an excellent job here. Uh, and thank you for attending, everyone. We're running out of time here, so we'll wrap it up as we're coming to the top of the hour. Again, um, before you log off, we'd appreciate it if you could go ahead and just give us a quick review, leave us any feedback, and follow us on Twitter. Thanks, everyone. That, this concludes our presentation for the day.